And I think we have to be very careful uh, with the influence that these lobby groups, not only in terms of the people they're sending to Ottawa um, to fill these kind of positions and check these boxes, um, but also what's going on within uh, these lobby organizations that I think trend towards the extremes, um, trend toward more hardline positions. Yes, you're absolutely right. And very rarely do any of these organizations reach out to reach out to people like you and me to say, let's sit down and have a conversation. They feel so much more comfortable being cowards and speaking behind our backs. But coming back to this whole Islamophobia bogeyman, uh, it's not only the critique, but it's also when certain valid inquiries are termed as Islamophobia. You know that the CIRA was uh, making some inquiries into Muslim charities because it's their job. Not just them, they do this for everyone. But immediately they were called Islamophobic. And, and, and our prime minister picked up on this and, and you know, uh, said that uh, this is not something they shouldn't be singled out. So we have to understand that we are living in a country which is a democracy and we need to be able to live by the laws that this land, in fact, Islam tells us, live by the laws of the land in which you are, unless it goes against your faith. But unfortunately, many Muslims have forgotten this, all these rules. Uh, you know, they are following an ideology uh, which is based on a cult. They are following an ideology uh, that is a victimhood ideology, which is, you know, extremist. And uh, if anyone uh, happens to ask a question, they are in, they immediately are labeled an Islamophobe. So uh, this is not going to go well in the long run because... Uh, you know, it's not uh, something that Canadians read, need right now, along with political correctness and the woke culture. If you also have, uh, you know, the Islamophobia about men hanging over people's heads, Canadians by nature are a very peace-loving, naive, trusting community. They're not going to speak out and this will then fester. questions I, I had for you, it's based on, an, uh, for both of you, um, or for you, Rahim, actually, based on an observation that uh, Rahil made, which is, you know, we need to distinguish between uh, the, these two things, uh, racism, bigotry, and uh, ignorance. And that's something that I myself have experienced many times. I've had very similar experiences uh, to, uh, to, to Rahil, where, you know, someone says something uh, I think, you know, insensitive and I, you know, up, you know, upon further interrogation, it just is that they, they, they meant their me well meaning. It's just that, you know, um, you know, the, the reaction, you know, most people would react that, uh, to that as being racist, but uh, actually if you engage in a dialogue with, uh, with people, I think most folks are actually just want to be well informed, I think, you know, and, and want to learn. Um, but, um, why is it that we're hesitant, and by we I mean those people who are quick to label um, people Islamophobic, why are they reluctant to um, criticize what's happening to the Uyghur Muslims uh, in China, what's happening to the Ahmadiyyas in Pakistan, for example, the Ahmadiyyas are not even considered Muslims by the Pakistani government, if I, if I, if I remember that correctly, um, and, and, and the kinds of atrocities that take place uh, committed against Muslims across the world why is that not a priority uh, to them why is it that they don't um, uh, react to that with the same uh, kind of zeal as they do with uh, you know everything else well i mean i, I think the world is messy you know you, you have situations where muslims are oppressors you have situations where muslims are being oppressed and and i think one thing about uh, the buzzword in higher education is intersectionality um i, I think intersectionality uh, it poses a kind of racial hierarchy. Um, it, it's, you know, if you're white, you're an oppressor. If you're not white, you're being oppressed. You know, if you're Christian, you're an oppressor. If you're a non-Christian, you're being oppressed. But the world, you know, is is messy and doesn't always conform to those types of binary. Uh, I, I mean, you look at, um, at Syria. I, I mean, you had these, um, you know, blonde haired, uh, blue eyed, blue eyed, I forget the name of the community, but the, the sort of Christian community in Syria um, uh, that was, you know, being subject to, to a genocide. I mean, I think it's it's uh, tough to have within this framework uh, of grievance culture, um, a vocabulary um, for kind of one set of minorities, Chinese people. By the way, um, you know, there's a ton of Sinophobia as well. 
in North America, there's been a ton of sinophobia um, surrounding, um, you know, surrounding COVID. So it's it's tough to, you know, have a framework for one set of uh, of people who, you know, we view as victims, we view as oppressed, um, you know, oppressing a, another set of victims. We don't have a vocabulary for that. Um, you know, we don't have an intellectual framework for that. And I think that's why a number of people would rather, you know, turn a blind eye to uh, the weaker situation, because I think one of uh, the truly, uh, I think, regrettable things about this kind of advent of its intersectionality and this intellectual movement of intersectionality is it forces people uh, to view a very complicated world um, through this binary of oppressor versus oppressed, this color-coded binary. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, uh, that's 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 well said. I mean, a lot of this goes back to this stuff that they teach in schools. And, uh, and and so Rahil, what do you make of that? Why why are uh, uh, you know why do you why do you see this reluctance to uh, um, uh, to to call out the atrocities committed against Muslims around the world? It takes there... away the attention from them being the victims. So this whole drama is about the fact that they want to present Muslim, let's say Muslims in Canada as being victims of racism, bigotry, discrimination, Islamophobia. So if they were to talk about another community that is being oppressed, then it takes that attention away from them, you know? But this is what is so badly needed, is, you know, for us to speak out about the others and see what is happening to them. But you never hear of these organizations making statements about what is happening, not only to other Muslims, but minorities in Muslim lands. And, you know, some of it is really atrocious stuff. Uh, so, uh, you know, Rahim is at that wonderful young age where, you know, he can give this intellectual uh, sort of touch to this whole conversation. You know, I just look at it very basically as being selfish and being self-centered and pursuing an ideology and an agenda which is entirely focused on this whole idea of getting into where policies are made and to, uh, you know, to influence Canadian policy, to influence Canadian political structure. And they're succeeding while it seems that uh, our prime minister and the rest of the leadership is blind to what is happening. And it's not as though we haven't said this before. You know, this is not the first time I'm saying it. Just, you know, see what is happening around you. Be aware of what is happening and look at the agenda behind it. Nothing happens without an agenda. And so, uh, you know, obviously, they're not that concerned about what's happening in the rest of the world right now. Speaking of agenda, uh, Rahil and Rahim, uh, you know, in Canada, there seems to be a game where every community claims as a phobia against them. So recently, a liberal backbench uh, MP here in Ottawa is made, making the claim that Canada suffers from Hindu phobia. As a, as a Hindu myself, I find this claim rather preposterous, and yet it's evidence we're increasingly a society built on grievances um, and identity politics rather than coming together as uh, Canadians with shared values and shared identity. Um, how did we get to this point? What do you make of this unfortunate turn in Canada? Uh, let's start with you, Rahim. Sure. Um, so I think we're at a point where we're bringing in half a million immigrants per year. And I'm pro-immigration. Uh, my parents are immigrants. I'm first-generation Canadian. But you know, when you're bringing in that number each year, um, it is very difficult to make them feel Canadian, um, to inculcate them with Canadian um, political institutions and you know, Canadian civil discourses. Um, so I think you have an increasing number of immigrant communities here in Canada who feel more attached with their diaspora communities back home than they do with Canadian civil society here in Canada. And I think a fascinating um, uh, a, a fascinating example of that is Sri Lankan diaspora politics here in Canada. Um, so as many of you know, um, I think Tamils in Canada outnumber Sinhalese in Canada six to one, seven to one, um, you know, by some astronomical margin, it's a very large margin. Um, and you're seeing Tamils, you know, in places like Brampton in the 905, um, be very strategic in, you know, how they pursue grievance politics. Um, not so much here in Canada, um, but even in terms of how Canada orients its uh, forward policy toward Sri Lanka. Um, you know, do we use the G word uh, to characterize 
uh, massacres of of um, of Tamils during the Civil War. Um, you know, you know, do we do we take the Tamil Tigers um, off of our list of known terror organizations? So I think, unfortunately, um, we have for economic. Uh, reasons and out of economic necessity, um, you know, we've decided to take in hundreds of thousands of new Canadians each year, but we don't have the infrastructure on the educational side and on the social side um, to really make those new Canadians Canadian. So I think it's, it's um, uh, you know, one, uh, I think, drawback of our set of policy choices um, and one symptom, symptom of that set of policy choices that I think is only going to become more intense in, in the decades to come. Yeah, well, one of the uh, failures of multiculturalism, actually, uh, something I've uh, written about quite, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite a bit. I mean, uh, we're Canadians first and everything else after, uh, not the other way around, right? And uh, and that's been a, a failure of multiculturalism. Uh, Rahil, uh, w w w do you want to jump into this? To put it in very simple words, this has yeah. happened because we have allowed it to happen. And multiculturalism being at the top of the list of the, the problems, you know, this idea that you have to force people to uh, like each other. No, uh, you don't have to. It's organic. Uh, people don't have to like each other as long as they live in respect of each other, you know, which brings me back, you know, back to the idea that if somebody holds negative views of another person, it's not a crime. Uh, you know, we are human beings and we are allowed to have that. And having said this, um, Rahim talked about the immigrant communities and, you know, uh, I'll put it in very grassroots terms that immigrant communities bring with them a lot of excess baggage, some of it, which is very political, and they don't know when to drop that. So they continue with that while they're here. And, you know, uh, Canada has been soft on this. They have allowed these international politics uh, to play out on Canadian soil where people feel safe. But it's not in the interest of the larger Canadian diaspora. It is not in, you know, the, uh, the idea that some people feel it's a sin to tell their children that they need to be Canadian first and whatever it is uh, next. You know, they tend to still live by the, the laws and the politics of the lands that they've come from. And therefore, we see it playing out here and we see it playing out in many different communities. Uh, so, uh, you know, when the leadership is soft on this, then it just grows and grows until it becomes a problem. <laughs> Yeah. The, all of this noise around Islamophobia disguises the fact that uh, violence and hatred are also directed towards some of the fine founding communities of modern Canada. So in 2021, for example, Canada saw, um, I believe, a 260 percent increase in hate crimes against Catholics. This is according to Statistics Canada. And it, this represented the largest increase in crimes against any religious or ethnic group. Um, but hate crimes against Catholics have no consequences. They don't even rent, rate a mention by the political class. Uh, and there's some suggestion that this increase in violence against Catholics may reflect anger against the history of residential schools. Um, but this is just hatred, just the same, and isn't being called out by our progressive elites. Do you think there's a double standard at work here? Absolutely. I have always had an issue with this. You know, the white man has now turned into the so-called enemy. You know, it doesn't matter what the white man does. They are the enemy. And this idea of pulling down statues and trying to erase history. No, let's learn from it. Uh, you know, so th this is very, very important. And, uh, you know, the fact that Christians or Catholics, uh, their, uh, the, the abuses against them or the atrocities against them don't uh, ever get counted uh, is, is, really, is really troubling. And then coming back to statistics, when you look at the police statistics, we see that the communities that have faced the larger, largest amount of hate crimes have been the Jewish community, the LGBTQ community, the black community, and then somewhere along the line, Muslims like other communities. But uh, these reports and this appointment of uh, an Islamophobia czar suggests to the rest of the world that the largest rate of crimes in Canada is against Muslims. You know, maybe Muslims walking on the street, streets are being abused and it gives a very, very different picture. So what kind of an image are we presenting to the rest of the world when Canada, to me, is one of the most tolerant countries in the world? It has its share of problems, yes, but uh, which communities don't have a problem? You know, we look at the, the past, look at the first immigrants that came, the Irish and the Italian. If you hear their stories and the amount of discrimination that they faced, 
But, you know, there was not an appointee to protect them. They dealt with it, you know, over a period of time, they dealt with it till they came to a point where they were able to be fully integrated. Mm -hmm. So every community has to go through those steps. Mm -hmm. uh, the Muslim community is relatively new, but they have to learn to reach out to others. If they're going to ghettoize themselves, they're never going to be able to be, be a part of the mainstream. So we'll move on to the next question then. Um, what is the, uh, to, to, uh, to both of you, what is the uh, state of uh, Islamic radicalization in Canada today? Is it better? Is it, has it, has it um, worsened or improved uh, compared to, say, about a decade ago? <laughs> you know, uh, this is something that we were tracking, and uh, a decade ago, uh, you could it was easier to hear the stories and get the statistics and find out what's happening. It's gone very quiet. It's gone underground, but I think the ideology is still there. Uh, it is, you know, I, I've always said that radicalization is not a physical manifestation. It is an ideology. It is a brainwashing. Uh, to uh, embrace the values of the Muslim Brotherhood, their 10-point plan. And, uh, you know, when I talk to the communities, uh, that is still there, you know, a, a non-violent uh, ideology. Uh, but you, you don't see so many, ex you know, so many overt examples of violence. So people think that it's gone away, but Islamists, who are the people who are promoting and presenting this ideology, are absolutely delighted with political correctness, the whole culture, the cancel culture, because it plays right into their hands. This is exactly uh, what they were looking for, is to be able to shut people up, uh, to shut free speech, to not have people express their opinions. And so, you know, in, in many subtle ways, it just does exist. But I would say that, sorry, I, I would add to this that people are much more aware. You know, the last 10 years, that awareness that has been created, they are much more aware of it. Great. Uh, Rahim, do you... you so I would add, um, I, I have a unique perspective, uh, perspective on this. I, um, you know, came of age, grew up in, in the early part of the 2000s. I was a teenager of the high school um, when 9-11 happened. And, you know, growing up, um, when you saw a Muslim on television, um, you know, was either a terrorist on a show like 24 or a show like Homeland or a taxi driver. And I think, you know, now in sort of the 2010s, 2020, um, I think we have a substantially greater amount of representation of Muslims, you know, in things like sports, in things like popular culture, you know, in the media, you know, you have these beautiful Palestinian models, the Hadid sisters um, that are all over, over the place in, in the United States, you know. Comedians. Yeah, comedians as well, um, Asis Ansari, uh, you know, so you have people presenting, you know, a template of what it's like to be an observant Muslim, but a modern Muslim in the 2020s that, you know, wasn't available, um, that imagery wasn't available in the early part of the century. And I think uh, that actually explains a lot of what's going on in Iran right now. Um, you know, I think it was always going to be a matter of time. Um, you know, before social media caught up with the regime in Iran, um, it's kind of people through social media, people through Instagram, um, you know, they're sharing um, kind of more modern interpretations of Islam um, that don't jibe with the regime's hard line. Um, so, so from for me, um, I can't speak to the uh, the big picture of radicalization because I'm sure there are also you know digital communities um, you know where these kind of disaffected young men um, maybe are being radicalized, but as you know, a 30 something Muslim, um, you know, today, I, I see a much more modern representation of my faith, um, all across popular culture. I mean, even a player on, on the Stanley Cup winning hockey team, uh, you know, last year, Nazim Kadri um, is an observant Muslim from um, from southern Ontario. So so for me, um, you know, as a young ish, still a young ish Muslim, um, I see more templates out there um, for how to be observant, how to be true to my faith, um, but do so in a modern context. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a point well made. And certainly times have changed uh, quite a bit since those days, uh, you know, since since 9-11 for sure. And uh, there are many uh, such prominent Muslims in popular culture. And uh, and I think that's also very important when you talk about uh, reform happening within Islam, right? 
um, that uh, that's that's sort of an important uh, path for to towards reform as well. Um, uh, Rahil, just uh, uh, one last question to the two of you. Uh, Rahil, you made a point uh, that uh, that one source um, of you know that it that attracts the ire of your critics is your staunch support for Israel. Um, and I kind of, I identify with this because I'm, I happen to be a sta- sta- staunch supporter of Israel myself and I often face flack from these so-called progressives for that reason. Uh, is part of the Islamophobia narrative, um, you know, is there a subtext of anti-Semitism here? Is, in other words, is anti-Semitism the ugly underbelly of those who hold forth on uh, Islamophobia? To a large extent, yes. There is a lot of anti-Semitism there. In fact, um, um, Professor Zine, uh, you know, <laughs> picked some names correspondingly, all of us who are supporters of Israel. And then B'nai B'rith published a press release and a report on her anti-Semitic remarks. Uh, so, you know, she has a, a history of having made some anti-Semitic remarks. So anti-Semitism is rife in certain parts of the Muslim community. And uh, definitely those who support Israel face a backlash on that. And, uh, you know, I am one of them. I'm unashamedly a supporter of the right of Israel to exist. Again, having said that, it doesn't stop uh, any kind of healthy criticism of uh, government policies like, you know, for every uh, any other country. Uh, but uh, this uh, definitely plays a very strong role in this. Yeah. Rahim, any thoughts? Sure. Um, so I, um, as you know, I lived in the United States for a number of years. Um, and I think in the United States, there's a much stronger connection between Islam and kind of black nationalism. Um, and I, you look at individuals like Louis Farrakhan, um, you look more recently at kind of what people like Kanye West, um, you know, have been saying about Jewish people. Um, I think, you know, that kind of, ugly undercurrent um, of, you know, kind of these kind of nationalistic kind of staunch, um, uh, you know, pro-Black movements, um, some of which have gravitated towards Islam. Um, You're seeing the anti-Semitism that underpins um, a a lot of of this type of political activism um, come more to the surface. And and in the United States in particular, um, you know, you've seen um, a substantial uptick of um, sort of uh, black nationalists, either associated with Islam or not, um, expressing more openly anti-Semitic um, uh, rhetoric, not just targeting Israel, but targeting Jewish communities um, within the United States, sort of perpetuating tropes about, um, you know, Jewish Americans involved in entertainment, you know, Jewish Americans in, involved in finance. And, you know, I've seen that. Um, uh, unfortunately, I've seen that type of thing on the rise um, in, in recent years. Well, anti-Semitism is on the rise globally. I mean, you take a person like Ilhan Omar, uh, you know, very openly anti-Semitic in a position like hers, prestigious, where she could have built bridges. So it's unfortunate that many people who are in leadership positions where they can build bridges, uh, you know, where they they can talk about coming together on commonalities, uh, you know, and respecting the differences, but they tend to then uh, perpetuate hate instead. And uh, that is not something that I am ever ready for. Uh, You know, for me, Canada is not a place where we talk about hate. We don't have to like each other, but we definitely need to respect each other and the differences that we have. We are definitely not all alike, but, uh, you know, in the work that we do, it's not just about myself. It's about supporting others who are persecuted, about others who are oppressed, about others who are facing racism and discrimination. And that's a great way to end the show, Rahil. Thanks to you. Thanks to you, Rahim. Uh, thanks to both of you uh, for coming on the show. Um, keep uh, fighting the good fight. And I ha- hope to have you both again sometime soon. Anytime. Thank you.